parte electrónica para mandar toda este, la práctica a YouTube. Uh, bueno, tenemos hoy con nosotros el doctor Chris Morón. Él es este profesor de geofísica del Departamento de Geociencias en la University, uh, Pen Pen Pennsylvania State University. Él este, está al cargo del Laboratorio de Mecánica de Rocas en eh, esta universidad y se especializa en el diseño de la construcción de equipos para este, la medición de alta resolución de las propiedades de las rocas. Um, sus principales intereses son la física de terremotos y la mecánica granular y la fricción y la fricción uh, el Chris Moron dirige también el uh, um, Center for Geomechanics, Geofluids and Geohazards y es director del Institute for National Gas Research eh, allá en la universidad él hizo su licenciatura en la Universidad de Nueva York el estado de Nueva York no la ciudad um, también hizo este, su, sus estudios de posgrado en Lamont University, eh, donde estaba con Gerardo Suárez, <ríe> cuando Gerardo era un postdoc ahí, ahí uh, se conocieron. También hizo un postdoc en la Universidad de Melbourne, y en, da, 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 luego fue un profesor adjunto en la Universidad de California en Berkeley, también trabajó un rato en MIT, y ahora ya están uh, ya en la universidad en Penn State. Um, disfruto mucho la enseñanza. Tiene una clase de más de 700 estudiantes. <laughs> Luego podemos preguntarle cómo lo hace. <laughs> um, eh, él, como este, vamos a ver aquí, investiga las leyes de fricción eh, para las fallas sísmicas y asísmicas. Y bueno, uh, hoy nos va a hablar de rheología y los sismos lentos. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Please. Chris. Okay. Thank you. Lo siento. <laughs> My Spanish is nowhere near good enough to. I can understand what people say to me, but no, nah, I'm going to speak in English. Sí, para italiano no no problema, pero. Uh, no. <laughs> okay, um, I want to start by acknowledging that this is part of the Distinguished Lecture Series for the EarthScope program out of the National Science Foundation, and, um, and also to acknowledge all the help I've had from Alan in making this visit possible, so thank you very much and other people here. Um, this is work that uh, has been done by many people, and um, so you see the names of some of them here, and I'll come back to a few of them as we go along. Um, I want to talk about the mechanics of slow earthquakes, and I know there are many people in this room who are expert at slow earthquakes, but uh, so I'll try to find a balance between some um, introductory, introductory material that brings everyone in and also doesn't make these guys go to sleep. We'll, find, we'll figure out how that works. Um, uh, and you'll see a, a big theme. I'm an experimentalist, okay? So I do laboratory experiments, um, studying frictional properties of material and trying to infer um, something about how those frictional properties could make uh, slow slip work. So a big part of what we're doing is this idea in this picture that uh, you could study something at this scale, 100 microns, look at the frictional properties of this material as a, an analog for the wear material, the so-called fault gouge, and learn something about tectonic faults, okay? So this picture is, you know, meant to indicate that um, thing. So we'll go from there. Okay, now I need to figure out how to make my timer work. And is it working? Yeah, I guess it is. Um, all right, so now um, I have as part of my type of title the spectrum of fault slip behaviors, and I want to make sure it's pretty clear what I mean by that. Um, I mean all the things that are in between the top and the bottom of this slide. At the bottom, I have something called aseismic creep. Okay, there's no um, dynamic propagation associated with it. It's not a self-propagating event. It is simply a driven uh, response of a material. 
creep, a seismic slip. I think those are common terms. At the top, I call them ordinary earthquakes. These are the ones we've known about for a long time. Last a dynamic rupture that releases strong shaking. So at the top and the bottom, in fact, are the things that if, as recently as 20 or 25 years ago, I think most people really kind of imagined that fault zones, tectonic faults, only slipped in those two modes of deformation. And, since, and over the last 20 years, plus or minus, we've learned a lot about all the things in between. Pseudomagenic earthquakes, tectonic tremor, ETS, low frequency earthquakes, a whole bunch of names of interesting phenomenon that have been um, uh, discovered in different ways. And I'll come back to this image, but if you're looking at it, it is the um, northwest of the United States and North America. And it shows um, a time period from December of 2015 to March of 2016. And you see um, the epicenters of a bunch of um, tremor events that are migrating over that time period in an organized pattern. So we have this really slow, by let's say ordinary earthquake standards, migration that's, um, that's a theme that I want to talk about, okay? I think people, certainly I am going to today, use the term slow earthquakes to kind of refer to all that stuff in the middle. Okay, it's not a very precise definition, but it makes it easier than talking about all the individual features. For me, I want to talk about those. I want to start somewhere um, basic and say, what, let's remember what we need, mean by ordinary earthquakes. I mean the earthquakes that cause this kind of damage. I yanked that off the, the internet the other day from that magnitude 7 north of uh, Anchorage in Alaska, right? So that, this is what happened in Korea uh, not too long ago. And okay, and so maybe this is not surprising, the, the idea that there's a strong shaking associated with elastodynamic rupture. It is energy that's been stored elastically in a rock and released quickly, right? So you know, that's the, on the one hand. And on the other hand, there's this kind of thing. Um, if you've never been to see the Hayward Fault or the Calaveras Fault in California, you should go see it the next time you're around San Francisco. Very interesting to see creep deformation at the Earth's surface. It's certainly the place where creep, fault creep, was um, first discovered in the United States in, in the 1960s, the late 50s. Uh, the so-called uh, Cienega Winery, for example, is the place. And then um, this is the Cal Berkeley Stadium, which is built right on top of the Hayward Fault in a kind of way that's uh, surprising if you think about the fact that everyone there knows so much about faults. But anyway, the Cal Stadium is being pulled apart by slip, by creep on the, the Hayward Fault, right? But an interesting question, and really a theme that I'll keep coming back to is, how do you make this happen? Why are they slow? And, you know, I, I, I want to be precise about that, but I want to also just be simple about it. How do you make something deform slowly? And, and let's, okay, take a, in a, a ridiculously simple picture. This is the, the famous um, picture of the San Andreas Fault after the 1906 earthquake just north of uh, um, San Francisco showing offset along the fault. Okay, so if we take that kind of block diagram, um, on the one hand, we can imagine yanking the side of it. Let's uh, just do a thought experiment. We yank the side of it, and then we let the, the center of it creep forward and slip, okay? So that, that can happen, right? That in fact does happen at some level. That is a driven creep motion that doesn't have anything to do with what I consider the interesting questions today. What I consider the interesting questions today are more like this. There's my fault. There's a little perturbation in the strain rate on the fault plane that makes it grow. And as it starts to grow, it grows on its own, okay? So how do you make the, you know, make the distinction between um, a deformation process that's simply a driven creep and a deformation process that's a, that's a self-driven, I'm going to use the term quasi-dynamic, because I want, you know, to the extent that you could connect with what you know about fracture mechanics or think about the way fractures propagate dynamically, the reason they propagate is because the energy that's released in an increment of slip motion drives the next motion. So ultimately, that's how you make something be self-propagating. And at some level, of course, it's trivial. You have to stop it. That becomes complicated. And you have to start it. But once it gets going, it's going to move. Well, we know a lot about it. It the dynamic ruptures. And in fact, you know, we've known from fracture mechanics that the propagation speed of ordinary earthquakes, kilometers per second, 
is kind of simple to understand at some level in terms of the way elastic waves are transmitted through rocks. Elastodynamic ruptures move at a speed that's dictated by the elastic wave properties and speeds in rocks. Elastic waves move through rocks at kilometers per second. Elastic dynamic ruptures, ordinary earthquakes, can move at kilometers per second. All right, now, if we're going to ask about how they're slow, it's kind of useful to start someplace simple and ask some questions about friction. So I've done that here. You've got the simplest friction experiment you can imagine up on the very top. The green line, the green the area shows the frictional contact. I've got a, a, sink, a, a spring that's pulling this block. And I'm going to think about the mechanics of this. And I, the point I want to make here is that for a long, long time, really, as when I was a grad student, this is what we learned. What we learned was that there was a bifurcation in the modes of deformation, and that you could either have this kind of stable sliding. So this is just a sketch indicating shear stress as a function of time. The shear stress rises until you get to some failure point, and then it just moves along. Okay, so this is an idea that you could just have creep, right? And the other option is that you could have a stick and slip style motion where the fault is locked or the frictional surface is locked until you get to a point where you reach a threshold and then it fails. Okay, so these are simple ideas, but there was a mathematical, you know, set of concepts that were that were produced to indicate that there was a there was a bifurcation between the two of these. This kind of plot I'll show it a few times. You don't have to figure it out, but it's actually a, use, a super useful way of thinking about this stuff because it shows the ratio of two control parameters, which I'll say more about as we move along. But you can think of like a phase diagram. And on the y-axis, just the perturbation size. So I've got little, some little part of my a fault surface or frictional surface that experiences a little bit higher shear strain. And what happens? If I make a big enough perturbation, I can make it go unstable. But in fact, what this, the, the theory shows um, is that uh, as soon as I cross one, I'll either have stable or unstable motion, one or the other of those, and nothing else. I mean, that's what we thought for a long, long time. And in fact, that theory comes out of you know, some reasonably sophisticated um, application of mechanics to complicated friction laws. I'm not going to go through all the details here, but this is the rate and state friction law. It is a generalization of the slip weakening law, which maybe people know something more about. Um, and it is. You know, it is just an idea that you could write down that friction, the, the ratio of the shear stress to the normal stress, is a function of some velocity or strain rate and some instantaneous state. And then the way it's a function of those two things is written in this top line here. There's a reference value, there's an empirical parameter A and another one B that scale two terms. One of them has to do with the slip velocity or strain rate, that's this term. And another one has to do with the way some state variable changes. So some instantaneous feature of the surface, it could be the contact area, it could be the age of contacts, it could be the porosity within a, um, a, a granular material. And then we write down some way for that state variable, state is theta here, we write down some way for it to change. In this case here, we write down the way we would do elastic coupling, we solve it, and okay, we, these people, this work from Jim Dietrich, Andy Rarina, other people, Jim Rice, um, he came up with a general solution that says that there's a critical um, value k sub c that has units of stiffness. People like to call it a critical stiffness. It's not a stiffness. It's a rheologic parameter. It is the thing that describes how fast, with displacement, not in time, how fast friction can reduce as a function of displacement. And that's what's shown right here. Now this is friction, right? So there's a, there's a term I'm going to ignore um, that is a, a correction, if you want, right? It's a one plus. So there's an inertial dominated term here. It has to do with the mass. I'll just stand in front of it. That's a good way to ignore it. And the rest of this is what's important, right? B and A are friction parameters. You can see there times the normal stress. This, if B is bigger than A, then it's going to weaken. And what this shows you is how much, how, how big the change in friction can be as a function of the displacement that um, dictates how fast the state variable can evolve. So K sub C here, units of stiffness, stress over displacement, or force over displacement, tells you something about the rheology of the material. Hey, okay, anyway, it's a long-winded way of saying, look back at this and remember that the, the simple thing that comes out of a pretty sophisticated linearized analysis of um, that system says that when the loading stiffness is above or below k sub c, we can have stable or unstable sliding, but we probably won't get anything else in between. Now, of course, that's, that's unrealistic, but it is the state of the art that I will come back to. It forms for me um, a kind of useful backdrop of, of where we're going.
All right, now let's look at this for a second again, and this is the part where I think maybe you don't need any more of an introduction to me from me because you have many of the world's experts in this department, in this university, um, who've been discovering and documenting how slow slip works. Um, one of the things you can see from here or from there, and I should probably have pulled images from your work, but okay, this is the images that I had, um, shows the idea that if we look here um, at the subduction uh, boundary off the northwest of North America, you see patches that are moving, and the, and the rate of motion, you can't see all this, this is 8th of August and 9th of September in 2010. It's propagating like a unilateral rupture, um, highlighted by tremor that are occurring along the, the, the uh, slow slip zone. And the slow slip zone moves at kilometers per day, very slow compared to the expectations. And actually, you know, we've known about this for a long time, actually. These are the, t the two of the, p the oldest papers that I know about it, the Sachs paper in 1978, published in Nature, and then this other paper in 1990 also gets at this, right? So, okay, um, where, am I, where am I going? I'm, I'm still sort of in introductory mode. I'm just trying to impress upon people the basic question here, and the basic question I've um, I've tried to, to nail down here with respect to that kind of picture or the v things that are going off uh, the, the um, western coast of, uh, of, of, of Mexico are here. Why are they slow? Is it a frictional or is it a viscous process? And then another question is, you know, can, how can slow slip? Can it be described by rate and state? That's another theme that I'd like to talk about in the next, you know, so 15, 20 minutes or so. Um, I, we, we were here. As a community, if we look back and think, well, how come we don't know more about this? Well, I, I know at least why I didn't know more about it until a few years ago. And the an answer is because there's very few examples of lab examples of repetitive, slow stick slip. And my friend Paul Silver, who I hope you knew, um, passed away unfortunately in 2009. Um, he was a big uh, leader in the effort to make the Earthscope um, uh, activity happen in the United States. He convened a meeting that I was in, in part of in 2001, and he always asked me this question, how come you guys aren't studying slow slip? I said, listen, Paul, we can't make it happen. It doesn't happen. Uh, I thought at the time, I said, Paul, it doesn't happen. Every time we try to make slow slip happen, we get fast stick slips. Fast stick slips in the, in the lab were kind of easy to make happen. They, they were, there were lots of them. And then uh, I was maybe not convinced it couldn't happen. I just knew it must be hard. I know, we tried lots of things. We couldn't make it happen, and I never read any papers by anybody else who could, so I assumed it wasn't possible. Well, that's not something I'm going to show you today, is it's not. So, okay, now again, before launching into some more details of what I've been doing, just to, just to try to summarize why this is an important problem, why, you know, what the basic questions are. Ordinary fast earthquakes, the rupture velocity is a few kilometers per second, understood pretty well in terms of fracture mechanics, okay? Slow earthquakes, the rupture velocity is kind of all over the place. In fact, according to me, there's a spectrum, but you know, one, some of the numbers are kilometers per day, or the particle velocities, right? So fault slip velocities of 10 to 100 microns per second, right? And then there's this really interesting question. You can scaling relations here between um, the seismic moment that's released when an earthquake happens, and the duration of the event, right? So for fast, for ordinary earthquakes, this cubic relationship between the seismic moment and the duration kind of falls out of some pretty simple thinking. Like, it, it, it can't be wrong. Okay, there's some, there's some factors that we don't understand, but you, when you write down uh, the equations for uh, the slip around a, a propagating dislocation, you get this. Now, there's also this, I mean, I'm just sketching stuff and you know, point, pointing this out the way Ide did, et al. did in that 2007 paper. This is slow earthquakes that just follow a different kind of scaling relation. And that, you know, if it's true that they follow a different kind of scaling relation, it implies something significant, you know? And so there's, there are two, let's say, basic questions one could ask just by looking at this, right? Are there really different scaling laws? Because if there are, it might imply that there are different physical processes going on. And then, you know, what makes them slow? Or another way to ask this question that I'm going to pull in here, because Alan suggested that I might get in trouble by doing this, I thought, okay, that's going to be useful, I'll do it, is to say, you know, can you make the same fault patch slip in a slow or a fast event 
the same exact patch at different times. So that's something I want to talk about as well. Okay, now um, I am going to kind of launch into some more details and tell you some things. And I this is a good time to point out that uh, if you have questions of any sort, just interrupt me. Don't wait. I'm not good at doing what I'm doing right now, which is slowing down for a second. Just start talking or raise your hand. Don't wait for me to stop if you have some question. Um, I, okay, it's a view from the lab because it's a lab-based uh, study. It is, it is a view that was, let's say, you know, uh, motivated by Paul Silver's question. How come you guys can't study that stuff in the lab? I'm going to tell you about it now. Um, it is a view about how stress drop varies as a function of slip velocity and stick slip events. Okay, the fact that, that we can make this plot means that we got to the point where we, we did understand how to make this happen in the lab. And a backdrop of this is that um, we figured out how to do this at Penn State right before I was going on sabbatical in Rome. And I had, you know, serendipitously, my friend Cristiano Colatini, I'd helped him build a lab in Rome um, for, I don't know, extending over the previous five years or so. And so a great thing for me was that I got to do a lot of this stuff in both of these labs together, simultaneously with, two diff with different people. All right, now, lots of people give an outline of their talk as one of the very first slides, and I, I, I didn't, okay? One of the reasons I didn't is because a lot of times you, you give an outline, spend a lot of time on it, and then you never get past, like, item one or two. I already got past item one, according to me, okay? What are slow earthquakes? So if you still have questions about them, let's talk about it now. How can we study them in the lab is what I'm about to tell you. Same two and three are here, kind of the same. Four is a big part here for me. Um, why are they slow? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into this quasi-dynamic frictional instability, the self-driven, and this. I'm gonna show you that there's a rate dependence of that critical rheologic weakening rate. Remember that case of C parameter. I'm actually gonna tell you that it's not constant. It changes as a function of velocity, at least in the lab experiments, in a way that explains what we see. Um, Everything I'm going to talk about with respect to this is consistent with this idea. So for somebody who has a background in fracture mechanics and thinks about fracture energy, then it's actually very simple to explain this stuff, okay, in a way, in words, it's very simple because what you find out, what you can say, is that the reason these things are slow is because the energy release rate is equal to the fracture energy. And when that becomes, you know, numerically true, then there's just nothing left over to make the thing accelerate, right? So that, that's, in fact, what certainly happens in the lab. Now, whether that happens in the field, I don't know. Look, I, is my, my, my view. And I'm going to you know, try to get at how this applies before the end of the talk in terms of that. There is a new way to study slow slips in, in the lab that we have figured out and done a fair bit with. These are the two papers that I'm going to talk about the most, published in 2016, in some ways are kind of old news, almost in a sense. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of other stuff that we've been working on since then, including some, some work. Um, published just re recently this year in uh, 2018. It involves uh, double direct shear experiments. I'm going to show you a little bit more details of them done Penn State there. Okay, that's a plot as a function of time of um, stick and slip events that have complicated kinds of behaviors. Now, okay, this is not just an experimental talk, but for me, it feels wrong not to make sure you have some idea about what we did. Okay, this is a schematic image of the kind of configuration that I like to use. It's not the only one that you can use. It just turns out to be useful for this kind of problem. Called double direct shear because there are two surfaces that are in direct shear that are going to shear simultaneously. This is a configuration that was invented by Jim Dietrich, at least in the context of geophysics. It's nice because um, in a typical direct shear experiment, you either have, you're limited to very low loads because you're going to put a dead weight on top of something and then move it, and that's fine. But if you want to go to geophysical loads where there's tens to hundreds of megapascals of force here of stress, then you need some way to push and also make something else move, and this this solves that problem. Okay, so that's the config, that's in the schematic, and here's what it really looks like, a si a, an idea of it. Um, we worked with two or three diff two main sample configurations. Both of them have a contact area that's kind of the size of palm of my hand, a few centimeters. This in Rome is a five centimeter by five centimeter contact area, nominal contact area of the frictional surface. 
at Penn State where you're using 10 by 10. Okay, I have some pointing in the wrong directions here. So this is 10 centimeters from here to here. I'm not going to talk about the acoustic stuff that we've also been doing, but we shoot elastic waves through these things simultaneously while making friction measurements, and there's a lot of interesting things that can come out of that. Just to be a little bit specific about the data I'm going to show you today, it is from uh, quartz powder. It is an analog, obviously. It's not, quartz powder is not exactly what happens in tectonic fault zones, but quartz is a major uh, mineral, so uh, it's reasonable if you want to look at granular materials to look at quartz powder, and we've done a lot with it. And, okay, in general, what I want you to see here is that this so-called double direct shear configuration allows you to make direct measurements of a bunch of the things you're interested in right at the sample. So it allows you to give you high precision. And without that high precision, you wouldn't be able to do what we're doing. Okay, so just an idea. That uh, schematic, an actual picture, this is the kind of DCDT that you use to measure displacements. So you get a fraction of a micron out of that, typically. Um, here are the coax cables that are, um, we have PZTs embedded in this loading block, shooting through. Um, I don't want to go into all the details of the um, configuration, but one of the what we realized early on was what we needed to control precisely the loading stiffness, the shear stiffness of our system. And we did it in different ways, but one of the things we did was to just replace the central block of that double direct shear configuration. Everything else is steel that's, that's um, coupled to the granular material. This is um, a PMMA, an acrylic coupled to the granular material to really de-stiffen the system. And that turned out to be important early on. We didn't do much with it later on, but let's see. Okay, now, um, if you're a friction guy like me, yeah, you end up looking at a lot of plots like this. And um, let's, let's look at it uh, together for a minute. I wrote friction there. If you don't like, if you want to think in terms of shear stress, it's the normalized shear stress. I run the experiments in a way that, this that we servo control the normal stress to be constant. It doesn't change by, out of megapascals, it doesn't change by more than a fraction of a kPa. Uh, the servo response system is good to 100 hertz, so we don't really know about, if you want to think about really high frequency changes, we don't, we don't know about, we don't control them, we measure them. But basically, for, for frequencies of 100 hertz and lower, the normal stress is constant. So this is just the normalized shear stress. And you see, I didn't show it all the way from zero because I want to focus on the stuff that happens up here. Kind of not very interesting at the very beginning. I'm showing it as a function of the control load point displacement at the top of this central block schematically. Push this down relative to the rest of the stuff that's fixed. Show you in, a mi in, mil in millimeters, and I'll also convert that to shear strain at some point here in a minute. The beginning of this is simple and boring. People have known about it forever. Um, you often see a peak strength followed by some kind of you know, stable sliding afterward. And then what happens after that is um, something we worked on for a while and almost like happened by accident. Because what happens if you get the conditions just right, if you're near the stability boundary, is that little perturbations in uh, slip rate, even in our sample, grow, and over the course of, I just blew several of them here, over the course of a few stick slip events, what is that, 15 or 20 of them, you go from stable sliding to a, stick, a mode of stick slip. All the rest of this is stick slip, and, but it's very slow stick slip, which I'll show you in a second. Now, you'll see two peaks there. Those are not artifacts. Those really happened in the experiment, and in fact, they actually tell an interesting story if you think about frictional aging, if that's something you know about or have ever thought about. You know, when frictional surfaces sit around for a while, they strengthen, and they strengthen like log time. In our experiments, we often stop the experiment at different stages because we use a really high resolution um, displacement transducer that has a small range. So every, it is about to go out of range, we stop the experiment, reset it. That typically takes a few minutes, it might take five minutes. And while you wait, the surface strengthens. So it happened right there and also there. So those are places where the frictional surface strengthened and then and then we started shearing it again and you see it kind of goes away if you look at the details of that that set of events here as a function of time well you see stick slip events okay so typical friction goes up drops goes up drops and then you see the details of the acceleration history this is the fault displacement here in microns that's 300 microns so we see the fault go from this background rate where it's basically stuck we see it accelerate and then slip. So we see, of course, you know, not surprisingly, we see all, kind, all the details and that's what we want. Um, I want to impress upon you the resolution at which you 
either have to or want to measure stuff. I heard um, Alan talk about the fact that I run um, high resolution lab. Yeah, that's a, high, we make high resolution measurements of rock properties at high pressure. And that's, that's right. So this is um, friction, five times 10 to the minus three, 20 seconds. This is two seconds and 50 microns. So you see, okay, there's a lot of resolution with what you're gonna be able to measure. And if you put a few data sets together, okay, now, so I showed you one data set. Now I'm showing you data sets from a few experiments at different normal stresses, and I'll come back to the significance of normal stress, but for now, you know, every one of these is plotted on the same kind of zoomed in friction scale. They're just offset so we can see what's what. And I've shown you the normal stress here. This goes from six, six to 14. And then I focus on the six MPA one down here in an image that shows you how friction changes the function of time and the slip duration. So slip begins here. I can kind of tell because the shear stress starts to go down, but I can also see because this is the velocity. So I'm just taking the derivative of my displacement curve and it's a little bit noisy, but you know, this is 60 microns per second. This, uh, this, sl this slip event, this stick slip event has a peak velocity of about 80 microns per second, okay? So it's, it's actually super slow, right? Um, and you know, this is where uh, I'm trying to give you some intuition about lab stuff, or maybe you know from somewhere else. At 14 MPA, we get a typical lab stick slip of the sort that I told Paul Siegel, Paul Silver, that um, we couldn't produce. We could only produce those, right? At 14 MPA, you see a typical stick slip event it bang, it's over in a millisecond, maybe five, maybe 10 milliseconds at the most. This slow, these slip events here, I've just zeroed all these at the peak value of the friction, normalized it, so you can see the difference in duration. So the, at six MPA, the slip event is taking a, a, an appreciable fraction of one second, okay? That was unheard of. And, and, and just to be clear, People have seen slow slip events dating back to the early 70s in geophysical experiments, but they were only kind of one-off. People thought they were an accident. I don't think people knew, knew what to do with them. There, before our papers in 2016, there were, not that I know of, any systematic studies where people could control the rate at which the failure occurred. So the fact that you can make a stick slip event that lasts often on order of a second was surprising, okay? I don't know, to us it was surprising. We, were surpri we spent a lot of time in those early days trying to make sure there wasn't just some mistake in our experiments or some weird thing going on or some, you know, I don't know, it, it's the usual thing with a, that kind of initial, you just don't know what it is. You might have an idea, but you keep testing hypotheses to find out that, you know, it isn't just an artifact of something. And that was where it was kind of nice for me in a way because we were doing the experiments at Penn State and in Rome on slightly different configurations. Now, so I just showed you that other data was from Penn State. The transition occurred at about six MPA. The machine in Rome is not identical and the sample sizes wasn't identical. The material was identical, still using a quartz material, a powder. We predicted, based on we had done the Penn State experiments first, we predicted that the transition from stable to unstable slip should occur at about 13 and a half MPA and here is exactly where it happens. 13 MPA, you just get stable sliding. So again, these are just friction curves. There's the, the scale up there on top. We're way zoomed in. 10 sec 20 seconds on here, just offset so you can see the difference between them. At 25 megapascals in the machine in Rome, those are typical fast stick slip events of the sort that Paul Silver said, how come you can't do anything different with? Have you ever been in the lab with a stick slip event? I hope you were in Schultz's lab at one point or another, you hear bang. Bang, I mean, it can be impressive. It's real, those big stick slip events have huge um, acoustic coupling to what you can hear auto, to the audible range. Bang, 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 bang. You don't hear anything out of this stuff here. It's just silent, okay? Um, and so, you know, here is um, a, a comparison of, the, of data that come from those experiments. Stress drop, you can see on top there that the stress drop is gonna be big for some and small for others and then the duration of the stress drop. So this is how long the slip event lasts. One second, 1.5, these are all super slow. Okay, you know, remember, um, the duration of these fast things is typically a millisecond or less, or maybe you know, tens of milliseconds. And, and appreciate the idea that we're working 
in the regime to ride, try to understand the transition from slow to fast. So we never really looked at all at the really fast stuff. If you keep going up in normal stress, they just get faster and faster. So we just didn't bother playing around with that because we were interested in this. So this is data from a whole bunch of experiments where you see stress drop as a function of duration. And in fact, this is one of the things that you see from seismic and geodetic data about uh, the slow slip kind of events in nature, right? Slow slip events have very small stress drop. And that's what you're seeing here. Peak slip velocity is a function of stress drop shown on top for that sequence of things. That's one data set from Rome. Here's the same kind of data set from the experiments at Penn State, shown in a slightly different way. And I want to, low normal stress, if you go to low enough, for us it was below 6 MPa, you only get stable sliding. And then you start getting these slow events. And there's basically a continuum in between. Um, and what's shown here are, for one set of conditions, the red dot is the average of all of them. And then the rest of them are all just the individual uh, measurements of the duration of the event, the, the normal stress, and the peak slip velocity. So I've just labeled some things up on top. And there's a couple things I know and a couple things I'm just putting in. I know this transition. These are just stable sliding events. There's no perturbation that looks like a stick slip event at all. On this hand over here, they're audible. I can hear them. Bang, bang, bang. I got bad hearing, so somebody else could probably hear, you know, so when you get to my age, you don't hear high frequency anymore, but somebody else could probably hear somewhere else in there, right? But everything in, in here is a slow slip event, doesn't have a high frequency coupling. So now, um, I'll spend a couple minutes trying to, you know, make you appreciate, like, what actually happens in the lab, and I think it has some implications in the field as well. Um, so, uh, okay, so I just took that plot, and I said, all right, slow earthquakes and ordinary earthquakes, that might, might be what happened. And uh, we looked at this before, and so I want to say, all right, so what I think I know about this problem, what the community knows about this problem, is that this, this is the control parameter here, the thing that, that controls the transition, is the loading stiffness normalized by this rate of weakening, k sub c, this rheologic parameter. So I need to measure these parameters. And of course, you know, I can also, as a teaser, say, look, if I just show you the range of data I have, I can already guess that something else might be going on. There is, this plot is too simple the way it was originally drawn. Um, and probably there's a region below k over k sub c of one where we have something else interesting going on. Right? So th this plot is a sketch I made. And actually there were some papers that were published even in the mid 80s where people said stuff like this. They said, because they asked the question, well, how do you make more complicated slip behaviors or what if? And if you use a two-state variable friction law, if you really make the friction law much more complicated, you can make more complicated behaviors. All right, so there we are. A um, simple statement is that if the difference between ordinary and slow earthquakes is defined by this, at least in the lab, then you know, I ought to be able to at least test that hypothesis, and, and I'll show you how it, how it works. Um, of course, when you look at the lab experiment, it doesn't look as simple as that, but it basically is. Our lab experiment is almost as simple as that mechanically. This is the layer zoomed in, so you have a sense about, okay, this is two millimeters, usually a couple millimeters thick. These are the, the imprint, These, this is an SEM backscatter image of the quartz material. You see shear localization surfaces within here. You see the imprint of the grooves that we, that we use to couple to the material. And then it allows me the, the possibility of saying, well, Part of this is just ridiculous in a, in a way, because of course we know what the stiffness of our apparatus is. That's what we do in, you know, in the first week of the lab course I teach in rock mechanics is let's go measure the stiffness of the machine, right? It's known very well. Well, it turns out we, we thought we knew more than we did. Because when you look very carefully at how the stiffness evolves as a function of load point displacement, it evolves um, in a systematic and non-trivial way and that uh, people didn't generally appreciate. So um, here's two ways to measure the stiffness in situ of the machine with the sample as part of it. Normally when you measure stiffness and you do it in a calibration, you don't have any sample and everything's easy. So what's done here is to just do load on load cycles. So you drive in, you back up, you drive in, back up, and of course you form a hysteresis curve. And what John Lehman did here was to just run this experiment and measure the slopes of these lines, right? So that is effectively the stiffness. This is the units. 
between 0.3 and 0.4, and he plotted those up here. Those are the gray lines, gray circles that are shown here. You see two at every roughly displacement because measuring both sides of that. The rest of what's shown on here is just kind of, you know, it's not a sketch, it almost looks like one because for every stick slip event, I also has a, have a measure of the stiffness directly. At the end of a stick slip event, there's an elastic period where the fault is not moving yet, and then as soon as the fault start move, starts to move, this curve becomes nonlinear, and that's so you can define the stiffness from everyone. Well, that's what that looks like, right? And you don't see that much in here yet, but what you see is that the, the, the value is about, um, so, you know, we're going to do these experiments with a whole bunch of normal stresses. We have to take the stiffness, stress per displacement, and divide it by the normal stress. And that's what's done right here to give these units of friction per micron. If you like uni uh, different units, you can imagine, all right, so if I did this experiment at 10 megapascals of normal stress, here's my stiffness, 4.5 megapascals per micron. 0.45 is the number. All right, well, sort of interesting because if I show as a function of shear displacement what I just, you know, sketch, what I just showed you, this is what it looks like. This is the stiffness, and I haven't shown anything here. I show plus and minus because I'm going to have to go through zero for a reason that will become obvious in a second. But this is what I see in my experiments. The stiffness increases a little bit, and then is roughly constant. So obviously I'm, you know, just being approximate about that part of it. And uh, I want you to appreciate the fact that that doesn't make sense. In fact, this was one of the things that early on in 2015 and early 16 was kind of driving us nuts until we thought of the rest of this problem. Because if the stiffness increases, in case of C is constant, then no matter where you are, if you're near the stability boundary, you're just going to go towards stable sliding. And it should predict that it'll get more stable as a function of displacement, not less, right? Well, that's not what happens. And the reason is because this is what happens with K sub C. And I'll show you the details in a second, but I wanted to stick with the schematic for now. So K sub C, and these are the numbers that we have measured, okay? So that for this material, in our configurations, I am um, proposing, saying, we know what the numbers are. So this transition, right, the, predict, the theory predicts that you'll have an instability when the loading stiffness is less than the rate of weakening when k is less than k sub c. In other words, when k, k over k sub c drops below 1. Well, we measure these parameters. We know exactly what they are. This is a schematic. But what this says is that, oh, yeah, it should be stable up to this point because k is not less than k sub c and then unstable after this point, right? Because that's what we thought we knew from the theory. And I just wanted, before I go to the actual measurements, point this out, right? This is exactly what we see. Um, because, you know, now I've got things shown as normalized quantities here, but if you put normal stress up there with B minus A, you see, right, so K sub C gets bigger at higher normal stress. And um, so what happens is the transition from stable to unstable happens at a smaller displacement at higher normal stress. It's exactly like what you'd predict from this, right? And then, okay, here are the measurements of K sub C, and this is maybe some detail, but um, this is part of, this is bread and butter for us, right? So we, you know, this is, if you run a laboratory that looks at modern friction laws, one of the things you're good at is making perturbations in the strain rate of velocity to measure the way friction responds to that. So we measure B minus A or A minus B, and we also measure D sub C. And in fact, these two plots our community known, knew about for a long time. We, 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 we could have predicted, these are from our experiments, but we could have predicted exactly what would have happened. D sub C gets smaller, it makes K sub C get bigger. B minus A gets bigger, K sub C gets bigger. So two things are making K sub C get bigger as a function of displacement. And if I pull things all together, you can see it's nicely done by Marco Scudetti um, from the uh, experiments in Rome. They are, there's a couple things shown here. I don't know, you, you probably ignore the schematic again there. Here's shear strain in the layer. So displacement nor normalized, or sh yeah, shear displacement normalized by the thickness, the instantaneous thickness. And then shear stress for three different experiments at different normal stresses. And what you can see is that at the lowest normal stress, the transition to instability happens at the largest shear strain. The higher the normal stress, the faster it occurs earlier. And then if you take that data and plot k as a function of shear strain, so it's only been done for two experiments here. And in fact, it's one of them is not even on there. But of course, here's what I showed you early on is that k goes up as a function of displacement and shear strain. But at 15 MPA, it plots up here, and at 35 MPA, it plots down here. Because this is 
this is k divided by normal stress, right? So the bigger the normal stress, if k itself is fundamentally constant, then it's going to be lower. That's fine to think about. Anyway, these are measurements. And then what's also plotted on here are measurements, Markov's measurements of k sub c. And there, you know, there's a kind of gray area because there's some uncertainty in that, and there's, um, there's different things that could happen. But there's, there's, there's a cloud that shows that, yeah, right here, um, k becomes less than k sub c, and then you have to go to a higher shear strain for that to happen at lower normal stress. It's exactly what happens. So, in, in a way, like, um, part of what we ended up doing with this was proving to ourselves and, let's say, the community that the rate and state formalisms and the mathematical things that have been done to try to predict the stability transitions work incredibly well, at least at the lab scale. This, these kind of lab observations of repetitive slow slip, they show a complete spectrum, and they're completely consistent with theory. Okay, let's say a modified version of the theory, or the most complex theory that was available. They're not consistent with the old idea that there's a bifurcation from stable to unstable sliding. They're, they're, they're consistent with a much more complicated version of that. In fact, what we see, what our data show, is that slow slip is dictated by this ratio of k over k sub c. It only happens when you're near 1, kappa is the k over k sub c parameter. If, as you get too far below 1, you get uh, dynamic instabilities. And as you go too far above it, right, so these are our actual numbers, right? Theory predicts that it should happen exactly at 1. I don't know if it does really happen at 1. Let's say there's some uncertainty in our measurements. Let's say there, there's some uncertainty in the way the, the theory comes together. But our measurements are consistent with the idea that slow earthquakes are happening. Slow slip happens, right? It's a laboratory earthquakes now. Slow slip is happening because we are near 1 in that theory. All right, now, okay, so here's a reminder to myself about a few things I can summarize and also ask myself this question. Why are they slow? Well, I haven't shown you this yet, but I'm about to, and it's only going to take me a minute or two. And then what I'd also like to do is to show you a couple things about this. So I'm just going to keep an eye on Alan here. And when he either gives me this or jumps up here and takes me off, I'll be done. It turns out that um, if you think about how uh, this stability transition could occur as a function of velocity, you observe that k sub c changes as a function of velocity. Part of it, I won't show you those measurements. It takes too long. We can measure b minus a and d sub c as a function of velocity directly, or we can see this kind of thing that just shows it to you directly, too. Here's friction as a function of time for an experiment at one normal stress. We're driving along at 30 microns per second, and we see these kind of instabilities. We drop down, we, we go up to 110 microns per second, we see a drop in the average friction, and there's a bunch of noise in here, so I see it too, don't you? But um, there's a bunch of noise, but friction is lower, like it's velocity weakening. And the stick slips are tiny here. There's, there's all the things that are going on. Then we change to 10 microns per second, slower, and we see bigger stick slips, okay? So what it tells you is that now I've replotted my phase diagram. I'm showing stiffness as a function of velocity, right? So if I just took the original theory, I would have a horizontal line there. Because in the original theory, I'm either at low stiffness, then k can be less than k sub c pretty easily, and I'll get stick slip. And if I go to high stiffness, I'll get uh, stable sliding. But what this data shows is that the k sub c line goes down as a function of velocity. This kind of shows it to you. And then you can also prove it to yourself by looking at that. So this is looking at a whole bunch of stick slip events as a function of different driving velocities, and pay attention to the idea that zero is on there. So in other words, when you get to the point where the friction drop gets, gets zero or below, then you're a stable sliding. So those things are showing you, especially at, se at 7 MPa, so the, I've shown you for three different velocities that we see a systematic decrease in the stick slip amplitude as a function of velocity in a way that tells you, yeah, that, that's what's going on. And you can see more details of it. I'm only going to spend just a second on this plot so that you can get a sense about what has to go into this. If you're a curious experimentalist, I don't know, you're always worried that something you're looking at, some artifact. So you do a lot of detailed things to, to prove this. And in fact, I would say, especially at 7 MPa, we're directly going across this line. So those columns are normal stress. 
and the sort of rows are velocity and what you can see. When you go fast enough at 7 MPa, you're stable, and when you go slower, you get bigger and bigger stick slip events, just like what you'd predict from here, right? And so if you take our lab measurements and plot them together, and again, I'm only going to spend a second on this because it'll take way too long to get the details out of it. You see something that's completely consistent. There are basically no free parameters here. This is, our, this is um, a control parameter in our experiments. We go at different velocity. We go at different normal stress. These are observations. So here are the friction drops that we've seen. Every one of these circles represents a set of detailed experiments. Under these conditions, we only see stable sliding. Under those conditions, we see unstable sliding. And here's what the friction drops are. And those lines right there are what you get if you just put in the velocity dependence of k sub c the way we think it exists. And I won't go into the details of that. I'll just leave you with that idea that the theory for the instability, the k sub c is a function of b minus a and d sub c, is entirely consistent with what we see. And I think it's kind of interesting because Outside of this study, I don't know another one where you can point and say, well, people really measured everything, both sides of the equation that says how instability should work, and, and it, it comes together. All right, now, as far as the, the lab side of this, or as far as the application of this to the tectonic side, I just say a couple things, and then I want to get to this second question. So where should they occur? Well, they should occur at the stability boundary. They should occur at the stability boundary because as a function of depth, if, if, my, if b minus a or d sub c is changing, what I know is that um, when it goes through zero, I'm going to see a transition of behavior. Remember, because k has to be less than k sub c. The numerator of k sub c is b minus a. Is when it, it requires that you have that velocity weakening condition. When, so when b minus a tr you know, becomes a negative number, then you'll never get an instability because k is a positive number, right? And then k sub c is going to be negative. So. That's the thing you, you probably heard many people talk about. You know, it comes out of theory, but it's actually almost like intuitively obvious. You know? So if, if I imagine that there's a transition the way many authors do, and Thorne Lay showed this like this, here's the seismogenic zone, and you get a transition. Well, the, yeah, you're going to get a transition. You should see slow slip because it occurs at the stability boundary, and the stability boundary is defined by the way k sub c changes as a function of depth. So that's, that's that part of it. But I pulled this because I thought it would be an easy way to talk about this. Um, in uh, 2016, uh, Deepa uh, Vedu and Sylvan Barbeau published a paper in Nature saying that in Parkfield they found places where uh, these tremors reveal slow and fast ruptures on the same asperity. Okay, I'm just Parkfield. And what the way they're, they, they have a numerical model that makes this happen, and the way um, then they have an interpretation of it. But what happens in their numerical model is that they see this kind of period doubling behavior. So in their model, they have time, they have, they have a slip deficit there, just like stress. So there's a slip deficit and there's a failure, a failure. And what they see in their model, the reason they're saying this occurs in the same place, because the model, nothing else changes, right? So they, the model has slow events and fast events, all occurring in the same place. And then they have an interpretation that goes along with fluid migration and fluid pressure. In fact, the way they make this happen in their model is that they jump up um, fluid pressure to make, it, uh, to make the effect of normal stress very low, and they see this behavior. Okay, they're seeing this with a rate and state model with uh, elastic interactions in a, in a half space. What I want to point out is that it's very similar to what we see. I didn't spend a lot of time talking about it, but you can see Here's the stability boundary. We're going from unstable to stable through in normal stress. And when you get near the stability boundary, you see a bunch of complicated behaviors, right? These, here's exactly the kind of period doubling that they're talking about. Big, a, you know, a small stress drop event followed by a big stress drop event, right? It's a period doubling idea in um, nonlinear dynamics and what people used to call you know, so chaos is that um, here's the period of this event or that event, and then it, it gets doubled when you're near this boundary. We also see this long period modulation of the stick slip amplitude, which is another indication that you know, the initial conditions are very important in this kind of configuration. So now what I want to do is come back to this and say, ah, yeah, look, when, you know, I, I see this continuum of behaviors in um, the lab 
And what I can tell is that, that normal stress is very important, right? So and I, also velocity is important for the rest of this, but normal stress is very important. So if I can play around with normal stress and I do it in a way that nothing else changes, then I can dictate exactly what will happen. And that's exactly what's happening in their experiments too. In their experiments, uh, their numerical experiments, they are increasing pore pressure locally to make it, to make the effective stress almost zero and then less than zero. They, and they're doing it with a, with a, a fluid pressure mechanism. So their, their work is exactly consistent with what we see in the lab. Okay, and, you know, so now we have to project to make it happen in the park field of disparity, but in the lab, we have you know, one fault surface, and depending upon whether we're on one side or another of this boundary or another one in here, I'm gonna see a slightly different kind of behavior. This is a dramatic change from stable to somewhat unstable, but for every change I make in the effect of normal stress, I get a change in the, in the behavior. So it's not at all surprising to me that I could get the same fault zone giving me this range of behaviors because I simply need to be able to play around with the effect of normal stress. Well, that's one interpretation. Okay, now I just want to um, wrap up with two or three some kind of summary things. And the first summary thing for me here is to say that, okay, look, we're, no, let's, let's just get it out there. And I hope somebody will, you, people usually ask me about this, you know, yeah, your experiments are so incredibly simple. How could they mean anything in nature? Well, I don't know, I could say different things. I could start out with, I don't know, but I'm just, you know, the f I, 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 in part, I, I put this plot up here because this is one of the things I suppose I, I either fall back on or think of, and it's part of my, you know, basic thinking is that, look, um, lots of simple experiments demonstrate a fundamental mechanism or process or technique that applies in many situations. I don't know if that's really true here. Well, time will tell. But that's, you know, in, these are the Brace and Byerly kind of experiments. This is a, you know, paper in 1966 that kind of, in, you know, made the, f made the first, let's say, modern connection between stick slip and earthquakes. Right? So we, we have that, and whether it applies here, uh, I don't know, time will tell. I, we'll find out. Um, John Lehman, uh, an incredibly um, talented guy. A lot of this stuff was part of his PhD. He's moved on now. Um, he loves to make instruments. So if you're, if you're in the business of uh, looking for geophysical measurements of things, we should connect you to John. Marco Scudetti finished his PhD at Penn State uh, in 2015, or, sorry, sorry 2000, the early 2014. And the nice thing for me was that and that fall, I went to Rome, and he was a postdoc. I, we got to work together again uh, in different settings. Lots of this stuff was just interesting stuff produced by Marco's ingenuity and skill. And then, okay, simple summary. I hope I've said all these things, but, you know, slow and fast, part of my view is spectrum of behaviors that's dictated, you know, observed both in the lab and in the field. Um, in the lab, uh, we have recently figured out how to show this full spectrum of behaviors. One of the things you see is that the stress drop is lower for slower events. Fundamental question of why they're slow, I showed you one answer. I don't pretend that that's the only answer, even in the lab. Uh, you know, the, our lab conditions are simple enough for what I showed you there that I am pretty confident that is the answer there, that there's a velocity dependence of the, of the critical stiffness. We've also done these experiments under controlled pore pressure. And, um, even in those experiments, I don't think that latency hardening is a big effect. But of course, it could be in nature, you know, that, that you could have a finite a transition in, in fluid pressure behavior caused by the, the so-called dilatancy strengthening mechanism, which you might know something about. So I've listed some mechanisms for slow slip that are, that are relevant to our experiments. I don't, you know, I think it's a good question about exactly what happens on natural faults. Um, and I guess, you know, so time will tell. What, what will really work is, is an interaction between the people um, like the very strong in this department who are making field observations and then the, the mechanics. So, okay, I think I've said all of those things and I thank you for your attention. Okay, so we have time for questions. All questions have to be through the microphone so we can also record this since it's being recorded, so. Um, if anybody has a question. Thanks, Chris. It's really a very illuminating talk. I appreciate it. Uh, could you speculate why the Hayward fault is creeping? 
why is the normal stress below what we see in other parts of the San Andreas, or are the frictional uh, is are the uh, frictional characteristics different? Yeah, interesting question about so why is the Hayward Fault creeping, or maybe why in general a lot of places the, the creeping section of the San Andreas Fault why does it creep? Um, what what we know about other places is that the creep is connected to particular um, mineralogy within the fault zone. So the idea that the normal stress is below the, the value still applies, but the frictional properties of the material in the creeping section, and I suspect the, the Hayward Fault too, are such that the materials are basically just velocity weakening or velocity neutral. The B minus A never becomes a positive number. And, and at least where we drilled in SAFOD, which was part of the, the EarthScope project, so, okay, I wasn't, we drilled, I didn't do the drilling, but we were involved um, fundamentally and in, in made friction measurements of the, of the samples that came up. And at least in the shallow part, three kilometers, the, um, the frictional properties are, are inconsistent with uh, unstable sliding. And um, there, it is basically, the, ans the, the answer is that um, the necessary and sufficient conditions for instability are just not, not present. Now, you know, another way to ask that question is to say, well, what would it take? And, and that's where I would come back to some of these plots that we have. Maybe I just will sketch back to one here. Um, so what this plot says, this is the perturbation size. So we can think of it on a fault that's stably sliding, Maybe I find some little region where the strain rate starts to, to um, get a little bit larger, and that's a small perturbation. So if I'm here, um, um, it, you know, or if I'm here, no matter what, any tiny perturbation is going to grow into an instability. But if I'm somewhere in, be, in here, then most perturbations that the fault sees won't grow into an instability unless there's an earthquake nearby that propagates into there, and then I get effectively a huge instability. And that, so that could happen. So... You asked me to speculate, I did. I don't know, I could have said, I don't know, because I don't know. The Hayward Fault, it's a good question. Thank you, Ali. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, it seems that uh, people that uh, study the slow earthquakes, in particular the migration of tectonic tremor, and very low frequency earthquakes have identified that with this migration there's always a seismic moment associated to that phenomenon. So there's something happening in the matrix of the fault zone that, that, that apparently is triggering those uh, small patches, uh, radiating tremor. <coughs> so a uh, it seems then, and, and that happens during the occurrence of a large, larger scale slow slip event. So it seems that there are secondary slip pulses propagating on the same fold that is already slipping uh, in a stable manner as well, because these slip pulses are not radiating seismic waves. Uh, so that you have two different patterns of stable slip in the same patch. So, as you mentioned, there are people that are integrating uh, rate and state friction laws with a couple, d two uh, uh, um, uh, state variables in order to produce or reproduce this kind of, of, of observations. But uh, my question is based on what you have shown, it seems that if you uh, find out a f mechanism that perturbates the normal stress in a suitable way, you may have different sleep behaviors, stable sleep behaviors, uh, 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 explaining what, what the observation is. So what do you think, so po all people studying slow earthquakes talk about the presence of high pressurized fluids, no? We have evidence from tomographic images or many different things. Uh, uh, what's your do you think that uh, but no there's no I mean I think uh, enough research regarding how fluids may evolve in, under those conditions so that normal stresses can change in the suitable way to explain all these uh, 
um, diversity of uh, sleep patterns. So, so which direction do you think is today more necessary to go? Uh, understanding better how fluids may behave that would match uh, all the predictions your model uh, uh, no, uh, say, or more only we stay in, in, in dry conditions or stable, normal stresses, and then how complex should be the frictional, how complex should be the way the frictional coefficient should evolve to explain the sleep pattern. So what do uh, you think? Very nice. I like it. Yeah. So you lay out. Uh, I don't know how many PhDs that would be to figure all this out. Maybe six. Maybe sixty. Not even sure of order of magnitude. But let me boil down what I think are the key points you're making, and then you can help me if I've gone off track. But one of the points you're making is um, a little bit kind of shown here, um, and that is the idea that there is a slow slip patch that is propagating along the fault, and the tremor events are illuminating either the front of the slow slip event or some other part of the slow slip event. And I know that y you, know, you showed me some data earlier uh, today of uh, in Guerrero, you see the same kind of thing. That, you, that, that It's pretty clear that, that you can imagine that the tremor are occurring um, within the slow slip zone. And in fact, the migration of the tremor tells you something about the migration of the zone that is slipping slowly. So there's that point, and I'm waiting for you to stop me if I've gone off track, but I think there's this point, how does that work, is, one of the, is, the, is a good question. And, you're, and you're, the second part of your question, I think, is that what you'd like to do, maybe I would like that too, is to find out a mechanism that we could explain both of those things, let's say all of that, with the friction law. Like how do I make a friction law that allows me to have this slow slip zone migrate and still have these tremor events occurring in there. And now I want to go to one other picture. I guess it's more or less just where I was because I'll tell you what my view is. It probably won't be very satisfying for you, but uh, I'll tell you what my view is, and it's, it's from this. So um, I'm going to come to the heterogeneity argument. That's my view. But I, I want to also you know, point out for everyone else, let's say, or just to make sure I'm not wrong about what you're thinking, that um, the tremor are not real earthquakes. They're low-frequency earthquakes, right? There's families of lower-frequency earthquakes. Then, in fact, there is some um, quasi-dynamic uh, uh, slip that's occurring in the, the, the tremor. The, uh, the low-frequency earthquake is deficient in the really high frequencies that represent very large accelerations. But it's not as slow in that tremor region as it is everywhere else, right? There's still some seismic energy that's being released in the form of an elastic wave that has some um, reasonably high frequency in it, right? It's, it's called low frequency earthquake because it's deficient. So it is a patch. It is something that's a little bit like, more like an earthquake than just regular slow slip. Well, okay, so it, it could be that you could find a friction law that would give that whole thing to you. But I, don't, I doubt that's the way it works, at least not in my view. I think that what, what happens is probably more like what Thorne Lay showed here. Right, so he's got, he's got red and orange patches. I don't even know. Let's see, red. Yeah, he, red are his regions where it's really um, high-frequency earthquakes, regular seismic events. And then these, these um, orangish regions here he calls conditional stability, and that's because I need a big perturbation to make it go unstable. It's not really going to be unstable by itself. So I could just... I could color this whole thing in by k over k sub c for me if I wanted to. And then I get down below here where I just have some tiny red patches in what is otherwise called um, white here would be un uh, stable creeping regions. And this is my view. I, and I think that, that you know, geologic heterogeneity tells us that we probably do have something that should occur like this, e even just because we have you know, a bunch of different rock types, we're not going to get the transition to occur exactly in the same place. And what I needed these tiny regions here to be small enough that they don't um, nucleate into a full-scale earthquake with dynamic instability. So they're smaller than some nucleation length. And then um, they could be the equivalent of a low-frequency earthquake. So, you know, part of my answer to you is that I want what you want too. I just don't think I'm going to get it out of one friction law. I'm not going to find one friction law that's going to explain all those things. I need to bring into, you know, I need to account for heterogeneity and other things. And 
if I wanted to explain it in terms of friction, I can just think of it in terms of k over k sub c. Of course, you know, if I wanted to think about fluid pressures, then I could have compartmentalized regions producing my heterogeneity. That might work for me. Um, so I don't know if that's unsatisfying, but anyway, yeah, that's my view is that heterogeneity is very important. And we could talk about the scale of the zone that we need to make a dynamic instability. That, that's a useful approach as well. <coughs> you have one? Okay. We'll make this the last question since uh, we're a bit over time. So go ahead. Yes. Uh, Thank you for your uh, interesting talk. Uh, if uh, slow sleep only con probably mainly controlled by uh, uh, normal stress or K or K sub C, relationship K and K sub C, in my understanding, uh, scaling law should change gradually or, uh, or continuously from slow sleep event to the ordinary earthquakes. But if you look at the scaling law, there are some typical uh, a gap. Mm. Wh how do you explain this kind of gap? Okay, so um, but maybe actually go directly to what you asked for first, uh, which I think is just in my next slide here. Yeah, so if we th if we look at this plot, seismic moment is a function of duration, and if there really is a big gap in here. Well, the first of all, it's not when I'm, you know, I'm saying there's a continuous spectrum from, from slow to fast, and maybe you don't see that here. Um, this is a weird place to be. You know, this is, a, this is a, um, about a magnitude 7 earthquake, and then, you know, here we are um, at, uh, at um, 10 to the 4 seconds, so sort of, a, you know, a week or so. So... I don't know, that does sound pretty weird. Like I, I, you, cause part of this plot, of course, you ask, have to ask yourself is, well, maybe we just can't observe that. You know, maybe we just haven't ever, maybe we don't have instruments that are sensitive in that time regime. But I don't think we'd miss a magnitude seven event that, um, that took uh, a, a, a week or so. So it could very well be that there is something else that's compartmentalizing, that's quantizing this diagram, but you know, as you probably know, there's a lot of controversy about this diagram anyway. I mean, what I told you about this diagram, at least in the lab view, is that there's no difference in the frictional mechanisms of, the, of what happens in the lab. We see the complete spectrum from here to there with the same frictional mechanisms produced simply by um, being uh, closer or farther from the stability transition. Now, whether that really applies in nature, I think you've got a good argument. I, I'm I'm not convinced that we that we really know that there's a cont continuous spectrum in nature, at least not looked at like this. You know, on the other hand, when you think of all the range of things that have been seen, tr slip transients, long-term slow slip events, sl short-term slow slip events, when you start thinking of it that way, certainly start. It sounds like a, tr a continuum, doesn't it? So, that's a good question. But another part of your question, that I want to spend just a second talking about is is this, and that is, you know, here, um, what I, you know, really focused on a lot was K over K sub C and the importance of normal stress because I did it experimentally by using a system where B minus A and D sub C didn't change much. You know, they changed a little bit in a way that I wanted them to change, right? So, so it maybe paints the wrong picture. Like in nature, all these things are going to change as a function of mineralogy and position too, and they all have a huge influence also. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so uh, let's thank our speaker again one more time. Thanks. So that concludes everything here. Thank you. Bye-bye.